conversations when those come up and just day to day corporate. And then I also work with a lot of investors. So venture funds and other similar investors. So before I get into the to the meat of the presentation, um, a couple things. I will try to keep my eye on the Q&A box. So if you do have questions during the presentation, feel free to type them in there and I'll try to answer them as we go along. And then I believe there will also be an opportunity at the end for, uh, for us to discuss any remaining questions you have. And uh, my contact information is on the slides. Uh, you can always afterwards, if you think of additional questions or if you, things come up that you just would rather ask on a one-on-one -on -one basis, please feel free to shoot me an email or give me a call and I'm happy to, to talk to entrepreneurs at any time. And I, I think I will uh, share the slides with JJ and Steven. Um, so if anyone, or you can just reach out to me directly via email and I can shoot you a copy of the slides if anyone is interested in those. All right. So with that, I'll dive right into it. Um, so if you're going out to raise money uh, for your startup, there's different structures. What we're really going to focus on for most of the presentation is preferred stock and what would be in the term sheet and kind of that process. But just to put it in context, um, and you're, you're probably aware, or at least heard of uh, different structures that, that you could use when, especially early on when you're raising capital. So it could be equity, um, and equity means stock in the company, actual shares of ownership, common stock, that's typically what the founders have. An investor is normally going to want preferred stock, which is what we'll focus on in the term sheet. Of course, you can raise money from debt for a startup company. It's typically hard to get bank loans or, or real quote unquote debt. Um, but convertible promissory notes are an alternative to preferred stock and raising money. Uh, and that is a very typical structure that you would see in early stage financing. Um, not the focus today of the presentation. Um, that could be a whole different uh, discussion in itself. And then there's some alternatives to, to convertible promissory notes, which are listed below. Um, safes, simple agreements for future equity, other convertible securities. Um, these, these have come to be much more common lately as well as a way to get uh, transactions done, financings done quickly and efficiently, um, and kind of mirror the terms of, of convertible notes without some of the downsides. So that's background. Um, but preferred stock, which, as I said, is what really planning to focus on today. Um, that's a class, separate class of stock in your company. It's, it has certain preferences, hence the term preferred, over the common stock, which is what you know founders, employees typically have in a company. Um, there will be, you know, exactly what those rights and preferences are, are, can be different in every deal subject to negotiation, and they can be really creative. That said, in kind of the venture finance space, uh, there is a, a relatively, uh, relatively standard set of terms, and within those terms, there's different variations that are often negotiated. Um, but people, you know, when you're talking to a venture capitalist, they know the structure that they want, and most entrepreneurs are going to know what they're going to ask for. So create some predictability. Um, and then, you know, they're typically named, as you probably know, by series of preferred stocks. So oftentimes the, the first kind of real outside capital you get will be a series seed financing. Um, that's just nomenclature that's come up in the last, you know, 10 to 15 years, really gotten more popular. Um, and then the more kind of classic naming is just by letters, starting with A and going down the alphabet for each later round. So series A, then B, C, D. Uh, and so on. Um, I think the, I want to say series H is probably the, uh, the, the latest round that I have seen um, that I can remember off the top of my head, but uh, it could go on indefinitely. And, you know, within that, <laughs> people come up, up with all different names. So you may have a series seed and a series seed two financing if you're not ready to go to series A. Um, and part of these are just, are just naming. They don't have any separate legal significance. All right, so the actual term sheet, we can dive into that. Um, the term sheet is gonna be where you negotiate most, most if not all of the important economic and other governance terms of your financing round. So it's, it's important to pay attention to uh, what you're doing at the term sheet stage um, and get good advice and making sure you understand everything that's in there. Um, because while we'll talk about it in a second, it's, it's not entirely legally binding. Uh, it's it's going to be harder to renegotiate a lot of those terms later on and, and uh, can create problems. All right, so to, on that point, 
a, a term sheet typically has a small number of binding terms that are actually a binding legal agreement of the parties. Um, and the rest of it is, is non-binding, we'll get to in a second. But for the binding terms, it, it would be limited if you're certainly if it's a, you know, a sort of official term sheet with a venture capital fund, they're going to want some sort of no shop or exclusivity clause, which basically says you're not going to sign a term sheet with them and then go shop it around and try and get a better deal. So you're going to have a period of time of typically 30 to 60 days where you're sort of locked in with that investor. Um, you may be able to look for other investors to participate in that round to fill out the round, but you're not going to go try and renegotiate different terms with a new investor during that period. So that's typically a binding term. Uh, confidentiality is almost always a binding term. So, you know, both parties are going to keep the fact that they have the term sheet and what the exact terms are confidential. And then you know, expiration date is pretty self-explanatory. It's just, you know, if a VC is giving you a term sheet, it's an offer for these terms and they're going to want to put some expiration date on it where if you don't accept it, it, it expires. So they're not have it offer just hanging out there indefinitely. All right, so the actual offering terms kind of break them into different categories uh, for ease of discussion. And the first one will be the pricing and the economics of the deal. So this is really what are the, the high level economic and business terms? Um, what price are they getting? Uh, what are the things that are going to affect uh, returns in an exit scenario. So the valuation, what are the liquidation preference? Do they get dividends? And we'll talk about each of these in a little more detail. And the second category of, of items in your term sheet to discuss and negotiate will be control and governance provision. So this is, do your investors get a seat on your board of directors? Do they have approval rights over certain transactions? Um, and, and going through sort of that, you know, what information do they get? All those things are, are really important, uh, particularly for founders. And then monitoring investment kind of overlaps a little bit with control governance, but uh, you know, investors are gonna wanna make sure they have the ability as a minority shareholder in a corporation to you know, stay informed to some degree on what's going on in the business. And you know, they often have their own limited partner investors that they have to report out to. Um, so again, we'll get into more details on what they would typically ask for. Maintaining increasing ownership. So they're going to be interested in, you know, a lot of venture investors are going to say, yes, I want to invest now, but we know you're going to raise more money. And I want to make sure I have the ability to sort of, you know, maintain my stake in the company and invest more money if things are going well. And lastly, liquidity. So in other words, what happens at the end of this, uh, the end of this story, which we hope we all get to a very happy ending where there's a big, you know, sale or IPO or some other liquidity event and what are the rights and controls around that for investors. All right, so with that said, take a quick break. I don't see any questions yet. So, okay, so really important, the, you know, the first question typically uh, when you're discussing a term sheet, probably even before you get the term sheet is what, what is the valuation? In other words, what is the price the investor is paying to invest in your company? Um, how much of the company are they going to get for the amount of capital they invest? Um, so this is obviously a big question. We get questions all the time from entrepreneurs. How do I figure out what the valuation is? There's no mathematical formula with a startup company to figure out what the valuation is. It's going to be determined by a number of factors. The, the biggest thing is going to be the market, sort of where the market is for similar companies at, that, at any point in time. So that's going to be your best data point. If you can find other companies uh, that have raised capital and get a sense of around what the, the valuation are. And, you know, that information may not be publicly available, but you can track that down by talking to uh, if you have existing investors or investors that you are friendly with that can share with you market data, your lawyers, certainly um, advisors, people that are active in the community and seeing lots of deals. And then some of the other uh, factors that will, will play into your valuation other than strictly the market are sort of obviously uh, your particular business, right? Like how big of an opportunity is it? A, um, where are you in the process? Do you have a product? Do you have customers? If you have customers, really important is sort of what's, what's the, the traction and the metrics with your customers and your revenue growth? Is everything tracking to look like it's growing rapidly? Um, the reputation and experience of the founders uh, and the team, it's kind of on here twice, it's two different points, but it's all 
uh, part of the same thing that that's a huge factor in determining you know valuation for startup companies um it just it the practical reality is for a a first-time founder it's going to be more challenging to get a really attractive high valuation as opposed to someone who's you know had one or two or three successes already uh where they're probably you know turning away investors and and can almost name their price if they've had a, a huge success and then of course the industry you're in um, and the overall kind of how hot is the market are, are important too. And I don't want to leave out, you know, uh, we talked about the business generally, but obviously if you have barriers to entry, you know, particular IP that, that sets you apart from others, um, uh, that's, that's important as well. Um, okay. So I got one question about board seats, which I'll get to when we get to the board section. So I'll save that one, but I just want to acknowledge we have that there. Um, there's a note at the bottom of this slide that says high valuation can be a blessing and a curse. So in theory, right, as a founder, you would say, I, I want to get the highest valuation I can, give up less of my company, which in, generally speaking is true. Um, but you should you also need to be aware that if it's a, you know, sort of disproportionately high out of market valuation that you're raising in a financing round, whether that's with a professional VC or you know, often cases, um, startups will raise money from kind of friends and family who, who are not really too concerned about the valuation. And they're just, you know, investing because they believe in, in the team and the founder and the business. Um, if you set that too high, it's going to create problems potentially down the road when you go to raise your next round and your round after that. Uh, if you're not, you know, the, the ideal in a startup is each time you're raising a round, you're kind of going up in value, right? As your company progresses, gets larger, you hit more milestones. Uh, so if you're not able to show that, it's going to at least raise questions of, of why you're not able to increase value. Um, and so overvaluing in the early stage can kind of at least raise those questions. Just something to think about. Uh, so pre-money valuation, uh, you know, people sometimes have questions or unclear on, on what that means. So typically the term sheet and, and you, there's a difference between pre-money and post-money valuation, which we'll get to in a second. Um, and it, people aren't always clear on exactly how it works. Uh, but one way to think of it this way. So an example, if you have a company, you get a term sheet from an investor that says, I, I'm going to invest a million dollars in your business at a $4 million pre-money valuation, right? So it, it pre-money, meaning before their investment comes in, your company's worth 4 million. And the way that would work uh, mathematically is they're going to invest 1 million. So after they invest an additional million on top of your pre-money 4 million valuation, the total post-money valuation is 5 million. And their $1 million is one fifth or 20% of that 5 million. And that's how much they would own. So that's just a, a illustration of how the math works. Um, and you, you, you do have to pay attention to the wording on this because there are more and more investors these days that are writing their term sheets specifying what the post money valuation is as opposed to pre money. Um, and that obviously makes a difference. You want to make sure you know exactly uh, what they're talking about and what you're agreeing to. All right, so aside from valuation, um, which, you know, again, if people have questions later or offline, I'm happy to talk about those. There are several other terms uh, that typically lead off in the term sheet that affect the, the economics of the investment. Uh, a big one is liquidation preference. Uh, on the one hand, this can have a big impact on what the actual economics of the investment are. On the other hand, in, in the vast majority of cases, it's, it's a pretty standard structure. So liquidation preference means that if the company is liquidated, uh, which can be either a, you know, a liquidation and shutting down of the company and a downside, or it can be a sale of the company, um, all hopefully on a very positive situation. Uh, the liquidation preference means that the investors are going to have for their preferred stock a right to get their money, their investment um, in our scenario. If they invested a million dollars, they get that back first. So they put hard, the idea being they put hard cash into the business. They don't control the business as a minority investor. Um, so as a protection for them, they're going to get paid back first when there's a, a exit scenario. So there's different variations of this uh, that, you, that you will hear out there. Participating versus non-participating is the main distinction. Um, 
And oftentimes, not oftentimes, the, uh, I'll get to in a second what kind of the standard metric is in a venture, early stage venture financing. Um, but there are, you know, lots of different things you can negotiate in, in variations of those. You will see some deals uh, once in a while where there's actually a multiple liquidation preference. So instead of just getting their money back, they get, you know, maybe two times their money back first before the common stock gets anything. Um, and the, the whole idea of the liquidation preference is to provide uh, would, is to provide downside protection for the investors for, in, for the most part in, in, a, in a bad scenario if the company doesn't continue to increase in value. And that this, the preferred stock's convertible into common. That's the last note here on this slide, meaning that you know if, if they're going to get more proceeds in a sale transaction by just converting to common stock, they have the ability to do that. It gives them optionality. So I have, um, before going on with the uh, liquidation preferences more specifically, uh, I have a quick question about does issuing stock meaning changing the articles of incorporation? And the answer to that is typically yes, right? Like your articles or certificate of incorporation are what you file with the state where you're incorporated that, that sets forth what shares you're authorized to issue, the number of shares, but also the type of shares. Uh, so as, as I said before, typically when you first form the corporation, you're going to have just common stock. That's what all the founders are going to get. That's what, you know, employees, advisors will get typically. And so when you do a financing round like this, like we're talking about in this term sheet example, you almost always will have to amend your articles or certificate of incorporation to create the new shares that you're going to be issuing. Um, and you, you wouldn't do that beforehand. You would do that as part of the transaction and kind of at the, at the very end of, of this presentation, I have a couple slides on, you know, what the documentation would be beyond the term sheet and actually closing a deal. And I can explain that a little more at that point. But good, good question before we get too deep into it. All right. So just to explain the, you know, I, I don't have the right in front of me, unfortunately, the statistics that I was looking at. But, you know, in early stage financing, seed, angel financings, even series A financings, it, the vast, vast majority of the time on the liquidation preference, it will be a it will be a um, non-participating one times liquidation preference. Uh, so what that means is, if we get to this example, what that really means is they're going to get whatever's greater in a sale of the company. They're going to get either their money back or they're going to get their percentage ownership of the company. Um, so again, these numbers have our same example. Someone invested a million dollars in a $4 million pre-money valuation, so they own 20% of the company, right? So the company sells a year from now for $2 million dollars they're going to get their million dollars back because that's what's that's their liquidation preference. If the company sells for a hundred million dollars, um, then they're gonna they're gonna get more proceeds by get taking their twenty percent ownership than they would their million dollar investment. So they would get their twenty percent or twenty million in that very simple example. Um, so that's that's one times meaning one times their investment non participating preferred meaning they get either or whatever's more, but not both. They get either their money back or their percentage ownership. And that, that's fairly standard, again, for early stage financings. Just for comparison, to contrast that to the other variations, in case you, you do see these pop up in a term sheet that you might be presented with or, or are negotiating, participating preferred means that it, it, it the word participating comes from the fact that they would get their preference, their one times their money or possibly more, plus they would participate uh, in all the remaining proceeds based on their percentage of ownership. So they kind of get both. They get the best of both worlds. They get their, their money back off the top. So in our example, if, if it, the company sells for $20 million, they get their $1 million first, and then there's $19 million of proceeds left and they still get 20% of that. So it sort of eats into the amount that's left for the common. Um, used to be more frequently that you would see a participating preferred, but especially again, in early stage rounds, it's, it's much less common these days. All right, so sorry, I was on the wrong slide here, but here is the participating preferred. <laughs> uh, so you can see how it, it just, uh, it, it gives a greater benefit 
um, to the investors and affects the economics of the deal. As I said before, the liquidation preference of more than one times their money, more than one X uh, is possible. You don't see it very often. That can often be um, that can often be something that comes up later rounds or in a distressed situation. Uh, kind of a, a compromise. The second point here is the participation feature can be capped, meaning that as as a as a compromise between participating and non-participating, uh, you will sometimes see a structure where the investors it's participating, but they're not going to get more than two x their money back. And if they're going to get more than that, they have to just convert and give up the preference. Um, and again, the thing to think about when you're agreeing to liquidation preference, you know, it might not sound that bad if you raise a million dollars and you did agree your investor demands, I want a two times liquidation preference. That might not seem like a huge deal, but if you know you're going to raise more money later on and later on, the, th the thing to keep in mind is when you agree to certain terms uh, in your early rounds, the investors that come later are not going to want to take something that's less or inferior to what your early investors get. So they're going to ask for the same thing. And it kind of just compounds as you go along later on. So you're, you're setting a precedent to a certain degree when you're raising money in the early rounds and just another reason to kind of focus on it and think about what you're doing. All right, uh, dividends are another kind of economic term associated with the preferred stock. Dividends means, uh, you know, in, in a public company, right? It means the company pays you cash equal to some amount every quarter or every year or whatever it is for each share that you own in the company. Um, most startup companies uh, do not actually pay dividends, right? Because you, they're either they're either you know losing money, so they don't have excess money to pay out for dividends, or if they st are starting to make money, they want to put it back into the business and grow the business faster rather than, than pay that out to investors. Um, <clears throat> so so you won't often see any required dividends, but it's, it's good to know what the terminology is when you are looking at a term sheet so that you're not caught off guard or confused by it. And the, the term you will most often see in a, in a venture term sheet is cumulative versus non-cumulative dividends. So non-cumulative dividends, well, let's start the other way around because it's maybe easier to explain. Cumulative means that there's a dividend rate, typically a percentage of their price, maybe 5%, 6%, um, of the amount they pay, pay for their shares that accrues every year um, or every quarter, whatever period of time it is on their on their investment. And it's typically not paid out again in a startup, but it would just accrue and add almost like interest accruing on a loan to the amount of their liquidation preference. Um, so that's cumulative, meaning it accrues and accumulates over time. On cumulative is uh, far more common. It's it's what you see, you know, in 90 some percent of a particularly early stage venture deals. And that's saying it does not accrue. Nothing adds to the liquidation preference. They're not entitled to it unless the board, the company actually declares and pays them. But if the board doesn't declare them, then they, there's no accrual over time. Uh, that That's pretty standard and what you should expect in a term sheet. So if, if you see something that says cumulative versus non-cumulative, you're going to want to ask that investor and your lawyer about that um, and probably something that you want to negotiate. All right, another uh, kind of the economic terms um, moving right along are the anti-dilution protection. So again, here, there's, there's a, a version of this which is, is pretty uh, standardized, which I'll explain in a second how it works. Um, but uh, it's good to know what the what these different terms mean, so you have an understanding of it when you see it. So in a term sheet, there's typically two types of quote unquote anti-dilution protection that that it will say the preferred have. One is what I call here structural protection. That just means if there's stock splits or stock dividends, reverse or forward stock splits, the the preferred shares will get the same adjustment as the common stock got for that. So if your company says, oh, you know, we only have 10 shares outstanding and we want to do a stock split so that we have 10,000, um, the preferred want to get the same adjustment. That's pretty basic and just kind of mathematical and completely non-controversial, at least should be. Uh, and the other is price-based. So this, this is really what goes to protecting the investor. Price-based anti-dilution means that the investor gets some sort of protection, which we'll go into in a little more detail, 
in the event that you issue shares at a lower price than what they paid in the future. So if you do a, a down round, often called, right? Like the next time you raise money, you, you sold shares to this investor at a dollar a share. Next time you're not able to raise it at that price or anything higher and you have to sell it at 80 cents a share, uh, your early round investor will get some sort of protection or adjustment if they have anti-dilution protection. So the, the impact of that is it, they, they have the same number of preferred stock, but they convert into more common so that they're not diluted on an ownership basis. So the, the, the pretty much the standard version of this is uh, what's called a weighted average anti-dilution protection, or you might hear it or see it written as a broad-based weighted average anti-dilution protection. So this is a, a, a formula that again is very standardized in, in the industry. It's in the NBCA National Venture Capital Association model documents, which anyone can access. Um, and it, it, it uses a formula that takes into account how much money uh, was was previously raised in the early round, the amount that's being raised at this new lower price and how much stock you're selling at the, the new lower price. And therefore also takes into account sort of what the difference in price is. And on a weighted average basis, uh, gives additional shares on an as converted basis to your original preferred stock investors. Um, so they get some protection. They don't get made whole if you raise, meaning their, their percentage is not fixed. That's not what anti-dilution means. It doesn't mean, you know, I own 20% today and I, I will never own less than 20%. Um, what this means and how this works is that they just get some sort of uh, compensation and, and protection if you do it at a lower price in the future. Um, so I've got a couple more questions that I will get to because they're on different topics, but I'm um, keeping my eye on there just, just to give you guys a heads up. So, um, so that's that. That's weighted average. That's again 90 to 95 percent of seed round, series A round have this version of anti-dilution protection. Um, there are other versions. So, for example, a full ratchet anti-dilution adjustment means that you, you, the price that the investor paid in the first round will get adjusted on a full ratchet quote unquote basis down to the same price that any investor pays in the future. So for our example, if, if I'm an investor in the series A round and I paid a dollar a share, and now six months from now you go sell shares at 50 cents a share, I get all my investment adjusted down to the same uh, 50 cents per share price. So the, you used to see this a little more often, again, once in a while you'll see it in kind of distressed scenarios. Um, but it's not something you should typically see in a normal angel seed series A round. Um, so if you do, again, something you want to talk about, hopefully negotiate. All right, before I move on to that, um, there was one question about anti-dilution. Uh, actually, two questions which are kind of related. Um, one was just about anti-dilution generally for founders, if that's something you that's possible. Um, and then the specific question about Facebook and what Mark Zuckerberg did in his company. So I, I, I'll just talk about those, the, they're kind of related points. And I'll just generally talk about ways people deal with it rather than the specific example. Uh, so the first thing is, yes, there's a way to do it, right? Like you can you can create a, a, a security, some kind of stock for the founders that protects them against dilution, um, but it's usually not a good idea, uh, except in some specific, particular specific circumstance where there's a really good reason to do it. The reason it's not a good idea is because it's it's not what a investor is going to expect or want to see on your cap table. Um, and even, even more than that, so that that's a, a big thing, right? So even if you take all the time to set up this structure where the founders are protected against dilution, um, when an investor comes in, they may tell you to just get rid of it or they may be completely turned off by the idea that you even have it and get, reconsider even investing in your company. Um, but even beyond that, it doesn't really work in the sense that, um, you know, in the ownership of your company, if, if you think of it as a pie, right? Which is 100%, there's 100% ownership. Um, you can only give away 100%. So if anyone is fixed in that pie, anytime you issue new shares, to somebody, whether it's an investor, whether it's employees, whether it's a new co-founder you bring in, 
uh, that has to come from somewhere. And, and the normal typical way you do it is it just dilutes everybody in the company kind of equally or pro rata, right? So if you give away 5% of the company, everyone's ownership went down five, by 5% of what they had before. Um, and so if you have one or more people that are fixed in their percentage, then that somebody is getting punished uh, essentially for any new shares that you issue. And it just usually doesn't work out right. Um, but it, it is theoretically possible and there's ways to do it. Um, I, I think in the, in the, the Facebook example, I, I don't recall all the specifics of exactly what they did, but, um, one, one thing that is a part of that aside from the dilution is just voting control. Um, and, and what you can do as a founder, uh, and again, this most investors would prefer a very plain vanilla normal cap table and so anytime you do anything different you have to have a really good reason for it or be a really you know interesting company that everyone wants to invest in so that they they don't care um but you you can have different types of common stock that have different voting rights so you know a, a founder could have kind of super voting common stock um or you know what we do sometimes is you've got like the founding team that has voting common stock, and then you've got a pool of non-voting common stock that you might have for option grants to employees for smaller holders that you don't really necessarily want to give voting rights to. So um, there, there are some things you can do around the edges, but, uh, but the, the, the large takeaway is, um, you know, th think hard about doing that before you do it and whether it's really going to benefit you in the long run. I have another question just before we move into a different section of topics about like, circling back to the valuation and, and how that's determined. Actually, the question is who sets it? So we talked a little bit earlier about how, how do you figure out what a valuation is? It's not really a mathematical equation when you're an early stage company and maybe you don't have any revenue yet, or maybe you don't even have a product done yet. So how do you figure that out? Um, as far as the question of who sets it? so. If you're talking to um, venture firms, uh, they, at the end of the day, they're, they're going to, most cases, present you a term sheet, which will say what they think the valuation is, and then you sort of negotiate it from there. Um, but as a, as a company, as a founding team, when you're going out to raise money, you, it, you do need to have a sense of what you think you would want to raise money at, what you think the valuation is. So that, that's where it comes into talking to folks and uh, trying to get a sense of um, you know, what similar companies are getting in the market, what recent deals are, so that you're going out with something that's reasonable and people aren't going to be uh, either A, taken aback if you uh, have really overly zealous expectations and asking for a super high valuation, or B, your valuation is too low and you're giving away too much of the company. Um, but happy to talk about that in a little more detail uh, later when we're live. All right, take a quick drink of water. The next section of my slides here is more on the governance and control issue. So that whole first section were kind of the, the economics of the deal, what they're, what they're getting for their money, um, how the liquidation or preference affects it going on. The control and governance rights are more operational. So how in, in things to think about, you know, when you're going into this, uh, this term sheet negotiations and discussions are, and you can ask investors this, by the way, how, how involved are they typically, do they want to be in your company after they invest? Um, most of the time, they're not going to just invest and go away and you're never going to hear from them again, especially if it's really like a VC, uh, that that's their job, right? To invest in your company, kind of do what they can to add value and be a part of it and monitor it for their limited partner investors. So that's kind of what all these different topics do. Um, the, the first bullet here, stockholder veto rights, typically called protective provisions in the term sheet. So these are really the approval rights of the investors. As, as, share, as preferred stock shareholders, what things are they going to have to approve in the future before you can do them as a company? Uh, and again, the thought process here is, look, they're minority investors. They're not going to control the company. Um, so they want to have at least some controls to say, you know, we're a minority, we don't have control of the company, 
but we're giving you all this capital um, that you're going to be using to operate the business. What are the things we want to have approval rights over to protect our capital um, and, and make sure that we're being treated fairly as well? And so there's, you know, a fairly standard list of things. Um, this, you know, this is an area that can be negotiated a little bit, um, but for sure, like a venture fund would expect to have as part of their preferred stock, at least as a class, this, this is typically like a majority of the preferred stock or some super majority of the preferred stock has to approve this. It doesn't mean you have to get every single investor to approve these things. Um, but the things that they would want approval are certainly like a sale of the company or liquidating the company, uh, your future financings, because that's typically going to have additional preferred stock that's going to dilute them. Uh, payments of, of dividends or share repurchases. That's because that's cash going out of the business to shareholders. So the investors who put in that cash want to have controls over that. Um, changing the size of the board. That's because if they have a board seat, if they have, you know, if you've negotiated with them that they have one out of three board seats, they don't want you to suddenly be able to go and change the board to 10 members. And now they just have one out of 10 and it dilutes their control. Um, and then, you know, there's other things that they may, they may ask for, could be negotiated, for example, incurring debt over a certain threshold, um, entering into related party transactions. So like with the founders, having contracts with the founders or your family members, those types of things. Again, meant to protect them as minority shareholders. Um, and then along with that goes the board representation, meaning do they want to have a, a representative that's on your board of directors, um, which is really important, right, if you're a founder, uh, to focus on what the board structure is going to be and who the members of your board are. Uh, from a legal standpoint in a corporation, the board is super important because uh, for a number of reasons, right, it's ultimately responsible for overseeing the business, kind of running the business, and importantly, the board is responsible for hiring and firing officers, including the CEO. So if you're a CEO founder, uh, you want to make sure you understand what the board control and dynamics are going to be going forward so that you don't you know, take in a bunch of investors, give up control of your board, and you're in a position where you could be let go from your own company effectively. But so having said that, um, if you're raising, you know, like a significant series seed financing round or a series A financing round where you've got, you know, sort of a, a professional VC fund coming in and leading that round, they most likely are going to ask for at least a board seat. Um, they, they oftentimes, you know, the founders will be able to retain board seats. Uh, there may be limits on, you know, maintaining share ownership or being involved in the company to, to keep those board seats. They admit the investor group may also want you to bring in an sort of independent outside director, hopefully someone with industry expertise to kind of just add additional expertise and relationships and, and kind of uh, knowledge to your board. Um, so the, that's a really important area to focus on in the term sheet stage. And again, make sure you understand exactly how that's going to work and what the implications are for you as an entrepreneur. Uh, so board observer rights uh, means that uh, if, if you haven't heard that one or unclear on what that is, a board observer, instead of having an actual voting seat on the board of directors, it just means that the investor has the right to appoint someone to attend your board meetings, um, but they don't get to vote. They're really there mostly to make sure they get all the information and are up to speed on what's going on and perhaps also, you know, contribute their opinions and as part of any deliberations. Uh, but again, they don't get to vote. Um, aside from the stockholder approval rights, uh, you will sometimes see in term sheets a, an additional list of approval rights or protective provisions that would require the investor director to approve. So these are typically a little more operational, like it might be uh, if the company is going to, as I said earlier, incur debt over a certain amount, or if, if the company wants to uh, spend a bunch of money on capital expenditures outside of the budget that was already approved, or it could be even approving the annual budget, there would be a provision that says that all those things have to be approved by the board, including the investor board member. Um, 
And so again, this is a way to, to make sure that there's a control for them. And you wanna be careful about that, right? Because it essentially gives that person a veto, right? There's some legal differences between having it as a board person approving it and just the stockholders approving it. Uh, because they're, even though that the investor board member is representing the investors, they, they have fiduciary duties to all the shareholders, including the common shareholders. So um, they can't just do whatever they want as a board member without uh, creating potential liability for themselves. Um, just something to keep in mind and again, talk through and make sure you understand exactly. These are the types of things that affect operationally the business on what you can and can't do going forward or who you have to bring in and make sure that you have consensus with. All right. Um, sort of associated with that without the control aspect is uh, different information and inspection rights that investors will want in order to monitor their investment. Um, make, you know, at a minimum, make sure they know what's going on with the business so they can report back both from a regulatory standpoint and pay their taxes, but also to their limited partner investors on what's going on on sort of a quarterly or at least annual basis. Um, so you will typically see that the company will have to provide annual and quarterly, sometimes even monthly financial statements to the investors. Uh, there might be other things you have to provide, like a copy of your annual budget each year, perhaps an updated cap table uh, every you know, quarter or every year. Um, and then, you know, some investors, we, ha we have one venture fund client who has a very specific kind of, it, it's not very burdensome, but a very specific monthly kind of dashboard reporting package that they always ask for um, so that they can, you know, just have a quick insight and know what's going on with the company. So the point there is to, again, make sure you understand what you're going to have to be delivering to these people, what obligations you're taking on, and that it's not going to be too much of a burden. Uh, and, and also, you know, exactly think about who's getting those information rights, um, and whether it's all investors or only certain significant bigger investors. All right, so that's kind of the governance piece of it. Um, some of these others are more the contractual terms that investors would negotiate and are pretty typical in a preferred stock term sheet. So one that is very important to most early stage investors is their participation right. Uh, there's different names for this, participation rights, pro rata rights, preemptive rights. They all essentially mean the same thing, which is um, I'm going to invest now. And when you raise money in the future, future financing rounds, I want to have the ability to invest in those rounds, typically to maintain my pro rata percentage, meaning that if I own 5% today um, and you do raise a new round next week, I want to be able to buy 5% of that round so that I can keep my ownership in the company. They, they have to, you know, put in the additional money on the same terms that you're offering in the new round, but it gives them a right to do that. Um, again, very, very typical and something that is very important to a lot of investors. One important thing, especially when you're on in earlier stage deals to think about here is whether all your investors get these participation rights or just some subset, typically it's called major investors or significant investors in the documents, meaning that, you know, is there a threshold? Like only investors who have invested, for example, over $500,000 are gonna have this right. Um, there's a benefit to doing that to the company. It's really, it, it can be twofold. One is in, encourage people to put in more money if it's really important to them, right, to get these rights. Um, but probably, you know, more importantly, looking forward is uh, when you do those future financing rounds, protect, particularly if you're doing really well and you have, have uh, a lot of investors interested in, in investing in your, in your round, you may not have enough room, enough dollars available to give to all the investors and have to cut them back. So uh, that, that's one aspect. And the other is just the administrative. If, if you... Uh, raise a financing round with, you know, 40 different kind of angel friends and family investors, and they all have these rights. That means every time you raise a new round, you're going to have to go to those folks, notify them there's a round, and they're going to have some period of time, typically 10 to 20 days to say, I want to invest or not invest. So that just the process of doing that can, can sometimes uh, slow things down for sure, sometimes create a little bit of a problem. So that's, that's an important one. 
uh, this, the second large bullet on this one at the bottom is right of first refusal on transfer by, transfers by founders. This is a pretty typical provision. What it means is that if the founders want to sell their share, they have their shares, they have a buyer who says, I, I want to buy you know, 10% of your common stock. Um, before they can do that, they have to offer it typically to the company and then to the investors. And the, and the company and the investors have a right to buy it from them at the same price they were offered. So theoretically, it puts the founder in the same place, but it keeps uh, sort of control over who owns the shares in the company. Uh, so that, again, is a pretty typical, um, you'll see that almost all the time in a, in a venture term sheet. So thinking about liquidity down the road, how, how do these investors you know, get liquidity on their shares? Because these are early stage private companies. There's not a market out there to sell their shares, right? So, so one thing you'll see in term sheets is registration rights. What those really are, are um, rights if the company were to become public for the investors to have their shares registered so that they would be able to sell them on the open market. Sometimes there's a demand there's a demand right where theoretically after typically five years, the investor could say, you know, you're a private company. We demand that you uh, register with the SEC and create a public market. In practice, that that's you know not really doable. We can't force someone to do an IPO. <laughs> so um, I wouldn't worry too much about that. So the registration rights can can be pretty technical. Uh, you know, I don't I don't think it's worthwhile to go over them in detail. For purposes of this presentation but um, when you do have a term sheet just make sure you understand what they are they're pretty standardized again so drag along rights are are important um, a drag along right means that in a sale of the company there are are some group of shareholders uh, or sometimes board members that can force all the other shareholders to sell in a in a proposed sale transaction so what, what you do want to make sure you have as a, as a typical startup company is a drag along right that basically says if a majority of the shareholders agree they want to sell the company, then all the smaller stockholders are forced to sell. So that, that's sort of good for, for everybody, the founders, the investors coming in. It's to make sure that if you have any small, you know, 1% stockholders, they're not going to create any problems when you go to sell the company. But you do in the term sheet and the documents, obviously, you want to focus on who are the, the shareholders of the parties that can trigger the drag along and make sure that it is kind of that, that normal mutually beneficial version and not a version, for example, that says, uh, if your preferred stock investors decide we want to accept the deal, then everyone else has to agree. Um, that's much different, right? Uh, dynamic going on there. So pay attention to the words. It's good to have a drag along as long as it's the right type of drag along. Um, a couple more questions coming in, which I will get to in a second. Uh, so co-sale rights, these, these go along with the right of first refusal on founder shares that we talked about earlier. So if, if a founder has shares, has a buyer that wants to buy those shares, they have to go through the right of first refusal process first. If, if maybe, maybe the price is really high and great, so the company and the investors say, I either can't afford to, uh, to pay for those shares or I don't want to, but now I have a co-sale right, which says I can sell as an investor part of my shares alongside with that founder um, when they sell it to a third party buyer. So the, the idea there is um, to protect, again, the investors are coming in, putting cash into the business. Uh, they're investing in the business, but to, normally a big part of what they're investing in are the founders, right? So what they, one thing they want to protect against is they wouldn't want the founders, you know, for four, four months down the road to say, oh, I found someone, I'm just going to sell all my stock to them and I'm out of here, right? And the investors are stuck in that company with a new partner. So this gives them a little control on that and ability to sell shares too. Redemption rights uh, would be an option for the investors to force the company to buy their shares back at some point in the future. Um, oftentimes it'd be like five years or something like that. In, in a in a early stage venture deal, these are very unusual. Um, in other contexts, maybe later stage deals, definitely more like private equity deals, it's much more common. Um, so again, if you see this in, in a, a seed financing round or even a series A financing round, it's a good thing to ask a question about and talk to your lawyer and advisors about. 
um, and, and most likely try to negotiate it out. But again, it's, it's ability for the investors to say after some period of time, you know, I don't want to be stuck in this business. Uh, it's not growing as fast as we thought. I don't see an exit. I need to be able to get out. So buy my shares back. All right, so a couple questions on, on things that we just recently talked about that I'll circle back with quickly. Uh, so, so one question was going back to the control and voting rights, would VCs accept a super majority vote in the bylaws for board and shareholder votes? So I, I think the question there is in, instead, of, uh, instead of having a, a separate preferred stock vote for those important items, the protective provisions, would, would a VC consider setting a supermajority threshold? So it's everybody voting together still, but it's just higher than a simple majority. Um, I, I would say typically, no. Typically, they would want that to be a preferred vote because uh, they don't know what the cap table is going to change and, and look like over time. Uh, so they, want, they like to keep to their kind of standard structure and terms. Um, but there are, you know, cer certain circumstances where that may work, and certainly if it's if it's a different situation, um, not your standard kind of venture capital investor, maybe it's a, you know a different type of investor, family office or angel investors, maybe that is a way you could deal with it. And then uh, another question was about what document would spell out the financial reporting rights to the investors. So I'll, I'll get to the different documents in the actual deal a little later on. But the, the first answer to that is in the term sheet that you're negotiating up front, it would, it would at, least, at least in like a summary bullet point fashion list out what, <clears throat> what the investors are expecting and asking for. And then that would be spelled out in more detail in one of the financing documents. Typically, it would be an investor rights agreement, um, but it would be in one of the final agreements as well. All right. All right. So th those are all the the kind of major terms in a term sheet that you would be negotiating. Again, a lot a lot of these are pretty well honed as as mutual expectations on both sides of what people typically see. There's points in each of these items that we talked about that you can negotiate one way or the other. Um, but you know, it should be a fairly smooth process, especially if, if it's a institutional or professional venture investor that you're working with. A few things, though, um, before we kind of move away totally from the term sheet, uh, just to kind of recap as you're thinking about this. So, so one is, and this goes back to the valuation, understand your cap table, the capitaliza capitalization table of your company. Um, you need to understand what it is now, how it's going to be affected by the new money coming in, um, you know, how much dilution you're, how much you're giving away to the investors. Uh, another component of that that we didn't really talk about in detail in the front is that in, in, in setting what the pre-money valuation of the company is, investors will typically say, and by the way, in our earlier example, if you remember way back then, an hour ago, if the pre-money valuation is $4 million, that includes an option pool of 10, 15, 20% that you will have available to issue to employees. And you have to include that in those pre-money shares so that me, Mr. Investor, am not going to be diluted by those options when you give them out to people. So the size of that option pool is, is, is important because it's more dilutive to the founders, not dilutive to the investors. Um, so make sure that how that works. If you have raised money with convertible notes previously or safes or any other kind of convertible security instrument like that before you're raising this preferred stock round, you, you definitely want to have a good model for your cap table that shows how those are going to convert based on what the terms of your new equity financing are. It, it's not always that easy to understand, especially if you, you know, we're actually closing a transaction today uh, with, a, with a company who had sold safes um, on four or five different sets of terms at different valuation caps and, and, you know, sort of just building the model to figure out how those are all going to convert based on our financing round took a while to do, uh, can be complicated and it's not always intuitive and, and you want to make sure you understand completely the dilution uh, before you agree to a deal. So that, that's really important. Um, have a plan. Uh, by that, I mean, you know, you should have, if you have a startup company, you should have, it, it 
probably is not going to work out exactly as you plan it to, uh, but you should have an idea of what's your strategic fundraising plan. If, if, if this is your first money, um, how much are you going to raise? How long is it going to last you? Importantly, what milestones will you be able to achieve with that you know, million or $2 million that you're raising now? Um, so that you're in a position at the end of that period of time where you're able to go out into the market and successfully raise the next round of funding. And, you know, the more you can kind of have that in mind of I'm going to raise this much, you know, $2 million now, uh, that's going to let me accomplish X, Y, and Z, and it'll last about 12 months, 18 months, whatever it is. And then I'm going to go and raise $5 million to get to the next stage, the more you can have that kind of plan in mind early on, uh, the better, again, you're gonna be able to understand how much solution you're ultimately gonna give away and make better plans for it. Um, so that, that's important. Again, I, you know, it's not gonna work out exactly as you plan it to, of course, uh, but, but at least you'll have thought through kind of what the issues are. Uh, and part of that is also when you're thinking about how much money you wanna raise, make sure you raise enough money, make sure it may probably, I usually say if there's more available, take a little more, as long as the terms aren't too, uh, too, too egregious in the investor's favor. Um, give yourself a little more runway and a little more cushion than you think you're gonna need uh, because you don't know what's gonna happen in the world, obviously these days or, or how available money is gonna be when you need it. Um, so it's, it's always better to have a little bit of cushion uh, but you also don't want to raise too much, especially if the valuation right now is low. And, you know, if, if you're building a company that you feel really confident is going to grow, be really valuable, then the value is only going to go up. So you want to, again, raise enough to get you enough time and to achieve milestones so that you can raise it at a better price in the future. That's kind of the overall message there. Uh, so know what's market. Again, this we did kind of talk about in several points throughout the, the presentation, but uh, you know, talk to your, to your, you know, extended team. <laughs> so not just your team of founders and entrepreneurs, but if you have already have some board members or advisors, um, if you already have some investors uh, or just people, you know, in the community, other co-founders who've raised money, talk to all those people and get an idea of what's, what's going on out there. And there is some, a lot of information that is publicly available to um, standard documents a lot of, of financing rounds are done with the National Venture Capital Association's standard set of financing documents that anyone can go on their website and pull up. Um, so th there is some information that's available for sure. Lastly, have plan B, meaning that if it, don't put all your eggs in one basket. If, if you've got an investor that seems really interested, uh, don't just quit pursuing other avenues as well. Have a backup plan, in other words. Um, or, you know, if, if your plan to raise $2 million isn't going well, have a backup plan that you can survive and get to a, a, a better point based on $1 million. So have plan A, B, and probably C and D as well. All right. So let me address a couple questions and then I've just got a couple more slides to go through kind of after the term sheet, what happens. Um, so one question was, what's the right time to get an attorney involved? before getting into these discussions for a preferred stock financing round. So, you know, I, I would say as early as possible, if you're talking to, and, and by the way, it should be uh, an attorney who has the right experience. So it should be a startup, you know, someone who has experience with startups and in the venture space and knows exactly what they're doing. Um, it's, it's like a doctor, right? Like everyone has different specialties. So um, don't, don't sort of waste your time. It's gonna be counterproductive if you have someone that doesn't have the right experience. Um, and the, my other point there is if they are a good experienced startup attorney, they're, they're gonna be happy to talk to folks even before you um, are able to formally hire them and start paying them. So having you know an introductory meeting or two and kind of helping you get to a point uh, where you're able to raise money and you know on the verge of doing that, most startup lawyers will be happy to do that. So don't be afraid to ask them about that too. Um, but I would definitely do it, you know, if you're getting a term sheet, you need a lawyer to help you review the term sheet. Uh, I wouldn't rely on doing it yourself unless you've done it 10 times before and feel like you have plenty of expertise. Um, and I would say even before that, you know, typically 
if you're thinking about going out and raising a money raising money in the market, that's the right time. If you don't already have a corporate startup lawyer to to find that person, um, so that you can you know at least the questions that you have like being raised here, you can ask them those questions and and bounce it off them. So that's that was one question. Um, sorry. Uh, there's a question about cost, which I'm happy to talk to you later if uh, if we have time, um, but that, that really sort of depends. Uh, there's a question just I think this is more like logistics about issuing shares who issues the shares. So the, the company issues the shares and that's that's really more just like a, a the process you're going to, you know, agree and enter into all these agreements and you're going to close and then the company will issue the shares how, how that actually happens is you know it used to be you would print up paper stock certificates and give them to the investors that's rarely the case any longer people <laughs> either just issue them electronically or they use a, a, a capital management platform to issue the shares electronically um, but that would be something you don't have to worry about at the front end that's the, the sort of the mechanics of, of how it gets done later on all right, so the financing process, aside specifically from what's in the term sheet, uh, this is just real general, but you know, you're going to start your process by getting together your pitch materials, um, finding investors who you want to share it with, either through your own work, through your advisors, your accountants, your lawyers, whoever it may be, uh, things like this, this whole uh, event. Um, Hopefully you'll get some meetings with some of those investors based on your initial information. You know, you'll probably have a few meetings with them. They'll do at least some diligence before they are ready to give you a term sheet. Uh, execute and sign a term sheet. Again, sometimes you'll have multiple, you know, ideally you have multiple term sheets coming in and you, you sometimes get to ne negotiate those simultaneously and pick the one that, that you like the best. That's an ideal situation. And that's what that's kind of the, the box in the chart that we've been talking about this whole time. Um, once you agree to and have a signed term sheet, then you're gonna go into that lockup or exclusivity period with your investor, right? Where you've got 30 to 60 days um, to actually finish their legal due diligence, uh, to draft and negotiate the final documents, sign them and close. Um, and that's where we get to. And, you know, this is not something that typically happens fast, although it can, but plan for, you know, at least six months process uh, to have money in the bank from the point in which you start thinking about and preparing for this. That's conservative, probably. All right, uh, I'll just go through this real quick and then we can see if we have some time to talk if there's further questions uh, for the live portion. So. These are the actual documents and this kind of addresses some of the questions that have come up uh, that you would have in a financing transaction. The first thing is the term sheet. That's what we've been talking about. That's mostly non-binding, um, but it is it is by signing it, you are agreeing in good faith to negotiate on those terms. So it, it's not a complete throwaway document. It does mean something. Um, and then yeah, after that term sheet signed, that's where you go into the kind of this, uh, the period where uh, the investor and their lawyers are finishing their due diligence and you're starting to draft all these actual transaction documents. Um, and there, there's five main ones that you would see in a typical venture capital transaction, sometimes vary, sometimes there's extra things thrown in there. But the term sheet we already talked about, it's going to have all the, the, the main high level terms. It's typically non-binding except for the parts that are binding. The stock purchase agreement is the main agreement that says the, between the company and the investors saying, you know, the company is selling shares at this price, the investors are buying them at this price. It will have uh, the mechanics of how the closing works, whether it's all at one time, whether you can do a first closing and then have more investors come in over a period of time. Uh, and there'll be a series of, of reps and warranties, representations and warranties about the company and the business that the company is making. Uh, that it's duly incorporated, that all its shares are authorized. Um, it doesn't have liabilities other than what's been disclosed. A whole series of things that you'll have to go through with your lawyer um, and make sure you've disclosed everything that's applicable. The certificate, we briefly touched on this earlier. There's the certificate or articles of incorporation, depends on what state you're incorporated in, what they call it. But this is what gets filed with the Secretary of State and sets out not only the number and type of shares you can issue, but 
also what are the specific rights and preferences of, of any preferred shares or anything other than the common. I typically have a voting agreement, um, which has two of the things we talked about in the term sheet, you know, what the board of directors looks like, who's on the board, who gets to appoint them, what are any limitations on that, and then would also have the drag along rights that we talked about. And the voting agreement um, would be signed by the company, the new investors coming in, and the founders and any sort of significant common stockholders as well. Uh, so investor rights agreement, this would be just additional contractual rights. Again, we, I briefly mentioned it earlier that the investors would get. So a, a separate agreement between the company and the investors that they would have their information rights on it. What kind of financial information are they gonna be entitled to and when their inspection rights um, would have those registration rights we talked about in the, the participation or pro rata rights as well. And then the last major document is the right of first refusal and co-sale agreement that has these transfer restrictions on the founder shares that I mentioned before, both the uh, right of first refusal where investors have a right to buy shares if a founder wants to sell them. And then secondly, the right of co-sale where investors have a right to sell shares with a founder if a founder wants to sell shares. Uh, you know, there will be, you, you, if you haven't been through the process before, you'll probably be surprised just at the number of sort of pieces of paper in a financing. There'll be other things, you know, board and shareholder approvals. Um, you may, one thing we didn't talk about in the term sheet terms is the investors may require the founders to subject their shares to vesting if they don't already have them. So that would be in a stock restriction agreement. Um, but again, your lawyers would manage sort of these documents with the investors lawyers. All right, so questions. Let me look at the list one more time and see if there's any I can answer quick, or I guess we can also go ahead and open it up at this point, either one. Um, okay, so a couple of questions I can start answering if, if we're in process of transitioning. Um, So one question was, would angel investors also want preferred stock or would they take common stock? The, the short answer to that is uh, almost all the time they would want preferred stock, uh, just, just as you know, sort of the, the same type of preferred stock we just talked about and went through um, that, a, that a venture firm or a seed investor would want. Uh, there, there are, there's always exceptions to that. So if, if you know, it's, it's truly friends and more friends and family than outside angels or it's a small amount at the very beginning of the company, maybe they would take common stock. So there's always exceptions, but typically they were, angel investors would expect preferred stock as well. So, oh, there was also a request uh, after the presentation to provide templates um, that illustrates the points. So we can definitely do that. I think the best resource for that is, is probably, again, I referenced it a couple of times, but the NVCA um, model documents, they have a model term sheet. So um, I can maybe share a link to that or something uh, on the end of the slides when I circulate them. Uh, but they have a, a temple model term sheet that goes through all the things we talked about. It includes optional different choices that you could have. It includes some footnotes with commentary explaining what some of the things are. So that, that's a useful tool. Ryan, you're all done. All the questions answered. Yeah, I think so. I mean, there's one, one more question here about with the protections for the preferred stock, would it be priced more than the common stock? Um, so the answer to that one is, is kind of yes and no. Um, 
No, in the sense that, you know, when you think about the valuation and, and what investors paying and, and what sort of your total cap table and post money valuation is, it's going to treat all the shares equal as if they're all the same shares on that point. Um, okay. But on the other hand, afterwards, like when you go to issue stock options to employees, uh, typically you would you would get a, a third party valuation done. What's the valuation of my common stock for those stock option purposes? And most companies are, are sort of incentivized to issue options at as low a price as they can to their employee to give them a better benefit. Um, so the, the valuation firm will often apply discounts to the value of the preferred stock and say, you know, the preferred stock has these extra extra voting rights, liquidation preference. So the common stock's worth some discount from that. So. Okay. Um, all right, any other questions from anyone? Please type them in. Also, uh, so did you get the last one, uh, Ryan, from Deepu? Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I see that. Um, so the question is if Founders have put in $2 million. So the founders have put in significant actual cash themselves uh, and are looking for $2 million of outside investor capital. Is it fair for the investors to get the liquidation preference, et cetera? And the other founders do not get any of that. So uh, I, I guess if the question is, is it fair? <laughs> I'm not sure if that's the right question <laughs> for me to answer. <laughs> um, the way, what I would answer is that the, the investor probably would uh want to still have their not probably they would still want to have their liquidation preference anti-dilution etc they, they may be open in a situation like that they may be open to the founders also having some type of uh liquidation preference or something as long as it's kind of junior to their new money that's coming in if that makes sense all right um it, it sounds like will may have a question to uh to uh, basically ask via audio. So I'm, I'm going to allow you to talk, Will. Here we go. So you can unmute and uh, ask your question, Will. OK, uh, if Will is not asking question, maybe if anyone else is interested in asking question via audio, just raise your hand. That's all I'm asking. Okay, so I'm going to bring uh, Ibrahim. Here we go. Go ahead and unmute. Yeah. Good, good morning. Very complete and comprehensive presentation. Thank you, Ryan. So um, I have a still similar question. I think you cover it, but for evaluation, because we are in the process of some due diligence. For the evaluation, what kind of, <laughs> how should I go ahead and look for those companies, other companies? How can I have a fair comparison? And how can I find that information? Who should I reach to to find that information? So, so, uh, so you're asking information about what uh, kind of valuations in the market are? Yes, you said find the other companies that have some similar technology or similar? Yeah, so it, it's, it is hard to find at least publicly, you know, most early stage financings are not made public or if they are, they don't say what the valuation was, right? So it, it, it's sometimes hard to find that, but I think there are a couple of resources. One are there are reports that are put out, um, you know, on a quarterly basis that give you kind of by three or four different sources they give you kind of averages or, or medians on what valuations are at certain stages or for certain industries. So that's a good data point. Um, and then, and then in, in, if you shoot me an email, I can, you know, direct you to what some of those are, or maybe I can even slap them on a slide and when I circulate it. Um, and then, and then it's also just asking around uh, people that are in the marketplace on what they're seeing. Um, and they, they may have, you know, they may have seen three deals and just have anecdotal evidence. But if you ask three or four of those people and each of them give you two, two or three answers, then you can kind of get a sense. Yeah, I will probably shoot you an email and just remind about that quarterly report. Thank you sure. very much. Yeah. I appreciate it. Thank you.
Thank you. All right, thank you, Ibrahim. All right, uh, let's see here. Uh, Will, do you still have a question? Maybe not. So, all right, I don't see Will here, so I'm going to. Okay, anyone else with a question for Orion? Audio question. Amit, here we go, Amit. Go ahead. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for the morning, presentation. Amit. It was fantastic. Um, Ryan, one question. Um, mine is also a startup. Um, I spoke with several people. They just said, like, start with uh, standard is with this kind of firm. One guy said 10 million, another one said 5 million. Start with pre valuation of 5 million with 10% uh, discount. Uh, some standard terms, actually. It looks like this is also kind of a mechanized, uh, mecha mechanized process, like where you cannot go too above or too less. Like, there is a standards. So who can help us to start these things? And also, like, for example, how many company shares we have to issue, right? For example, if because I have to pay my employees who are not employees, part-time workers, right? So um, like not cash, but as stocks. So let's say the value is 5 million or 10 million. How many we should issue? And who can help us out? Is there a point of person we can reach out to us that this itself is a field to get some help? Yeah, I mean, I'm... I'm happy to, to talk to you off the line if you want to reach out to me about more specific questions you have. But yeah, I think, you know, the, the number of shares you issue on, on the one hand, theoretically, it doesn't really matter because what matters is the percentage people own. But I, I think, you know, we use the same rule of thumb here that I think it sounds like you got from someone else, which is typically tell people to start out with like 5 million or 10 million total shares. Um, Cause that's, just the number of people are used to seeing results in a price that makes sense. If you're giving uh, shares or options to employees, you know, they, again, even though it's the percentage that really matters, they probably feel better about getting 10,000 options than they would about 10, right? <laughs> um, just, yeah, uh, that's, that's the whole point I'm asking, like, what's the quantity we should raise? So for example, I was working at a big company for June 17 before five years back, United Health Group. They're like $200 billion company, right? The kind of stocks we had like 0.00001%, right? Yeah. But the quantity was, <laughs> let's say, 500 or, th or 1,000. Now, if you give dollar per share and you give 10,000 sh shares out, right, versus you give them 50,000 shares out, quantity looks huge and you are more benefited. You know what I mean? I mean, we don't yeah. know what's the perfect, you know, I mean, we, ideally, we should issue as much quantity as possible, right? So we can... So the number looks better. People, otherwise, even if you give them hundred shares, they may say, "Oh my God, just hundred? And if you, give, <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, uh, hey Ryan, why don't you give them a hundred thousand at point zero 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 ten zeros and a one? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, that and that. No, the, the, there's there is a point, you know, to what you're saying, and the, there's no exactly right or wrong answer. Um, but again, that, that's where, what we normally say, like 10 million is a good number to start out with a startup for total shares, uh, just tends to work out. The numbers are workable when you go to raise money. It's, it's a, looks like a decent number for employees. Mm -hmm. All right. but there's no, there's no magic to it. You could, you know, you do a million shares, you could do 50 million. Right. Okay. Hey Ryan, uh, the, the, can you put your email address in the, uh, in the chat? for everyone they're asking for it. Sure. All right, so if there are no more questions, uh, we're, we're, we're gonna have, uh, like I said uh, earlier that we have another uh, webinar on Monday. It's uh, for R&D tax credit. So uh, please join us. It's gonna be a lot of fun. Hello, this is uh, Ryan. Hello, Ryan just- Hello, uh, coming back from the city of Paramount. Sir. You were asking for- Wendy? Yeah. Uh, Ryan just <laughs> uh, Ryan just put his email address in there. So please, uh, if you have any questions for him, uh, please email him directly. Uh, we will have a virtual networking right after this. Uh, right now, we'll, we'll as soon as we drop off the Zoom, we'll go into uh, the Hio uh, virtual lounge. If you're interested in being there, Ryan, can you hang around for a few minutes there? Yeah, happy to. All right, all right. So. We'll hang around for a few minutes there. If you're interested, uh, just grab the link and the password. Password is straddling-2020-VIP. 
and the link is right there. So um, other than that, I will see you on Monday. Uh, and the final uh, round is uh, part two is on Tuesday. So uh, thank you all for being here and we will see you uh, on the other side. <laughs> All right, thank you, Ryan, so much. All right. that was, Thanks, everyone. Uh, that was very, very valuable. Um, you made something that was very complex look simple. It's not simple. Thank oh, you so yeah. much. <laughs> See you soon. All Thanks. right, thanks, everyone.